Bob, going to be telling us about designing astronomical projects uh, for real-time discovery. Good, thank you. I really enjoyed this meeting. I, I really, really like meeting, going to meetings that are outside my field. And it's going to be obvious I'm outside my field because I'm going to say all sorts of things about decisions that I don't really know. Most people in this room know a lot more about decision making than I do. Um, just a few, I should just put some names up. Um, the two names in bold are the people who I kind of am most relying on here. But the, the, the uh, stuff I'm going to talk about is pretty philosophical. So a lot of people contributed to it. So I, this is really not complete. Um, Bloom's name will appear later. <laughs> Uh, uh, good. I'm just, I'm just going to try to start conversation. I thought this is a workshop that's supposed to create some discussion, so I'm going to try and start some discussion. Um, and I'll be, I'll be trying not to be uh, uncontroversial. Um, and I, I literally did not put a single image into this talk. I'm an astronomer, and there's no image at all. That, that hey, what's fun. up, Gil? Uh -huh. um, so... Uh, uh, I, you can Google the things that are written in the titles of the slides. If you want a picture of the Kepler mission, Google it. Um, uh, okay, good. Uh, I'm going to talk about. I'm going to. I'm going to start off with some conversation about exoplanets because it's a place where real-time decision making is really important, um, and it's going to be something that is very important in the next decade um, of big projects. There are six methods for finding planets around other stars, and I'm not going to talk about them. Uh, there's two methods that I am going to talk about. One is transits, which has found thousands of planets, and the other is radial velocities, which has found hundreds of planets. Um, I have a but not for long there, because very soon Gaia will come in and kill everybody. Um, and Gaia will get tens of thousands of planets. Uh, but that won't be for a couple years at this point, something like three years. So what is a transit? An exoplanet transit is when, because of very good luck, because an orbit is aligned with our line of sight, um, the planet comes between its host star and us, and we see it because it dims out part of the light. So, uh, so if you imagine an observer who's in the right place looking back at the solar system, the Earth, every 365.25 days, blocks out a little bit of the light of the sun uh, because it passes in front of the uh, the face of the sun. Um, and uh, they're very simple. Um, there's another, the other sort of leading method for finding planets, and as I said, well, I'm going to say a little more about planets that have been found by trans. The other leading way to find planets is the radial velocity method. And here the idea is because the, the planet and the star are in a gravitational orbit, the planet and the star are orbiting a common center of mass, and we look for the variable Doppler shift of the star. So the center of the mass of the sun, or the center of mass of the solar system is actually inside the sun, but it's not at the center of the sun. So as the planets orbit the sun, the sun is moving with respect to that very center. Um, and the important numbers here are that Jupiter-like planets produce meter per second signals, and Earth-like planets produce centimeter per second signals. And meter per second is pretty amazing when you think about measuring that kind of stuff. And I'm not going to talk about measuring. I'm really just going to talk about decision making. There's so much beautiful stuff about all these measurements and how they were made. And I'm basically not going to talk about that. Um, the the mission that's, capable, that's responsible for finding the thousands of planets by the transit method is basically the Kepler mission. There's a bunch found by Corot, um, by, also by later versions of the Kepler mission. But the, the big one is the Kepler mission. And the Kepler mission is. Uh, 42 CCD camera that just stared at one patch of the sky for four years. That's all it did, and it was designed with exact, and this is very relevant to what we're going to talk about in a minute, it was designed with exactly one purpose, and that's it. It was designed to find Earth-like exoplanets, and all the trades, when I say trades, I mean all the, the things where they decide, should we do this kind of detector or that kind of detector, should we put more CCDs or fewer CCDs, all those trades were made for the simplicity and stability of the instruments so that it would find Earth-like exoplanets. No other science goals were considered in its design. It's very, very limited goal. Um, and it delivered way more planets than people expected. People expected hundreds of planets. It produced thousands of planets. And it also did amazing science with stars that was not planned for, um, but all worked very beautifully. And there's a, there's a beautiful story about open science and everything that we were just talking about, which I'm not going to talk about. Um, 
Now, transits are a very blunt tool. When, uh, when you see a transiting planet, you don't learn that much about the planetary system. You learn the period, because you see a periodic dimming of the star. So you learn the period, and you learn a radius ratio, the ratio between the star and the planet. And oddly, you re learn the density of the star, which it's very interesting why you get the density. There's a beautiful thing in physics, which is that frequencies are density. If you have gravitational physics, frequencies are densities. So we often know the densities of objects much more precisely than anything else. For instance, we know the density of the universe very precisely. Why? Because the Hubble rate is a density. Um, uh, but um, uh, uh, but so anyway, in the transiting case, we basically just learn the stellar density, which is a little odd, and we get no information really about the orbit. Beyond that, we don't get any eccentricity or anything like that, and the signal is unbelievably sparse, and this is problematic observationally, and when you think about if you wanted to make a really adaptive system to find transits, there's a lot of trouble because the system is so sparse. The, sun transit, the Earth transits the sun for 13 hours every 365.25 days. So that is... Uh, very, you're, it's, you have to be very lucky to observe it because you have to be aligned with the orbit and you have to be very persistent to observe it because you have to stare uh, with good time resolution continuously. Um, so transits really are terrible. Um, radial velocity is, you get a lot more information out of radial velocity experiments and typically the way radial velocity experiments work is that you have many nights per year on a very expensive telescope. This is on the ground now. The, the, Kepler, of course, was in space. It's a NASA mission. But typically, the extreme precision surveys uh, are done on the ground. And you measure Doppler shifts for a few stars every night. Um, and the key thing about these surveys is because they're so data starved, they can only do a few stars on a few nights a year, they don't want to waste time on stars that won't produce planets. So people operating these surveys tend to make very harsh decisions. So if a star looks like it's very noisy, they drop it. If it looks like it's not showing any signs of planets, they drop it. If it looks like it's in some kind of binary, which would make it hard to distinguish the planets, they drop it. There's lots of harsh decisions made. And those decisions are made based on the star's past data, which is very problematic. And no one to this point has ever fully automated these decisions. That's very critical for what I'm going to say. Actually, you know, this meeting was a, is, is about real-time decision making. For me, I want to take it up one more level, and I want to talk about automated decision making. Because real-time decision making done by humans is very different from a point of view of data analysis from uh, real-time decisions made by computers. They're very different. And I, I will try to give a sense of that, although I won't quite spell it out as much as I'd like to, because I haven't figured it out yet. So um, I can't say this enough. We say this endlessly in my group. This is the big problem we're always encountering. We're working with data sets. We're trying to build probabilistic models of data sets that were created by humans. And we cannot model the, what the humans did inside those shitty conference rooms. It is enraging um, that w even though hundreds of millions of dollars have been spent on radial velocity experiments, we have no idea in detail why each observation was taken. And uh, that is problematic. Um, so uh, from my perspective right now, there's lots of interesting things to do with exoplanets. They're unbelievable. They're very good tools. They're a brand new class of astrophysics, astrophysical objects, like no one had seen a planet around another star. Uh, 10 years, well, 15 years ago. Now we know thousands. So they're a new class of objects. Of course, we're interested in finding, understanding how our own solar system worked. There's a lot of interesting things to do with exoplanets. I'm focusing, and I'll talk a little bit in this talk about the problem of how do you find out the properties of the whole population of planets? So the, the surveys I just talked about, the Kepler and radio velocity surveys, they're very focused on discovering exoplanets. But now, new exoplanets individually are not that interesting. It's much more interesting now to ask, what's the population, the population as a whole, how do, and what does that tell us about how planets form, and uh, how planetary systems evolve, and what planetary systems are stable, and what kinds of stars produce what kinds of planets, and so on. Um, and there are very complex selection effects. Um, now, radial velocity experiments should be critical for understanding exoplanet populations, but in fact, they are not currently being used in population inferences. And the reason is that they have humans in the loop. 
and we don't know how to model the humans. It's hard enough to model all of these selection effects. It is impossible to model the humans. Well, maybe not impossible, hard. Um, by the way, if you're not an astronomer and you are not following this world, I want you to remember three things about planets. This is the only thing you need to remember from my talk if you're not an astronomer. And it has nothing to do with the main point of my talk, but it's more interesting than anything I'm going to talk about, which is that there are more planets than stars. That is now very well established. I can't say that all stars have planets. Oh, one of the things that's very interesting about the statistics of planets is it's much easier to say how many planets there are per star than how many stars have planets. And it has to do with the fact that the, it, you have to be lucky in order to get them. So because of that luck aspect, we don't know which stars don't have planets. But we do know how many planets there are out there, and there are more planets than stars. The other thing, the next thing is Super Earth and Mini Neptune. So things in the radius range between Earth and Neptune are the, by far, not just slightly, they are by far the most common kinds of planets. And there are no such planets in our solar system. And then thirdly, the solar system is not really typical, although it's not clear yet just how atypical it is, but certainly it doesn't have, it has eight planets in it, none of which are uh, in, this, in this most common category. Um, uh, good, so my, one of my main points is that humans are unbelievably good at finding planets, but they're very bad to model, very hard to model quantitatively. And so we, right now, if you, if, you, if you just sort of naively try to use the radial velocity data, presuming that the humans were just somehow trivially rational, um, you'll get wrong answers. Um, and there's another problem is that humans don't like to waste time on control samples, which is a very big problem, uh, which I'm not really going to address, but it's very much part of the same situation. But to be absolutely fair, I'm not sure that the time allocation committees would have given the uh, astronomers telescope time if they had uh, done what I'm about to ask them to do. So, Dave, so we did this in the dark energy yeah. survey for supernova. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And I oh, did you put in control samples? Good. I'm going to talk so, about cosmology so, in a second. Uh, yeah. So w w one of, of course, the major biases is that we like to stare at something that we can get good data. Mm -hmm. And and so this bias is where we look. Yeah. We like of course, yeah. outside the galaxy Absolutely, rather yeah. than even exactly, yeah. like that. Yeah. So for the first time, yeah. we wrote a code that says, this is the object you will take a spectrum of tonight. Yeah, yeah, good. And, Congratulations. And we did not even use, like, we, we also said, Let's take spectra of things that we know are things that we're not interested in. Yeah, yeah. That's and, important, yeah. And, and, and so, by the way, of course, nobody mentioned this to any of the techs on any of the <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. Because you definitely get rejected if they, they say that a computer's deciding what your targets are. Like, Hell no. I, I'm sorry, we are not going to waste 10% of our time. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Have you heard of anybody else in astronomy do, putting in a control sample? Yes. The, yeah, there are, definitely, glass? there are definitely successful proposals with big glass that involve okay. control samples. In fact, um, even in radial velocity exoplanets is starting to happen. So Heather okay. Knutson, for instance, at Caltech certainly has some control objects. Okay. Um, but, uh, and the, but it's very field dependent. And right now, like we've had, we've had proposals rejected at ESO because they wouldn't be as efficient at finding planets as other proposals. And we're like, uh, D like you have to be inefficient if you want to do statistics. Yes. Just kind of as, an, as an outsider, so if I pose the question, show me a random star. Uh -huh. You know, could, what how, what's the framework you need for answering that? Good. That's a, that is that's off topic. Like pull one out of the urn. Good. So I so I'm not going to answer that exactly, but it's very similar. So in in medical inference, when you're doing medical inference and you can't do a controlled experiment. So you're trying to figure out whether people taking over-the-counter medicine is helping with their colds. Um, you, and you, so you don't have the opportunity to do a controlled experiment. You, what you do is you try to build very, very closely matched samples of people who did and did not take the cold medicine. Based on a passel of attributes. Exactly. And so that's how we, when, when we've constructed the best control samples we can, it's that we take all the attributes which we believe, believe, uh, uh, could be confounding, and we match on all confounding things, and then use those as controls. 
So we don't just take random stars out of the urn. We take very carefully stars that match the stars that are in our main sample. Um, OK, good. I'm being negative. I don't want to be negative. The exoplanet revolution has been unbelievable, and the radio velocity contributions to it have been incredible. I mean, what we know about exoplanets is unbelievable, given what, like, we know things about spin orbit alignments. We know things about dynamical stability. We see planetary systems in all sorts of resonances. I mean, it's ridiculous. Um, OK, good. I'm going to switch gears now. That, that's going to come back. This, I'm going to set context with a few different examples, and then hopefully somehow they'll be related. Um, Sloan Digital Sky Survey. So the Sloan Digital Sky Survey was the first really big university-based uh, uh, astronomy project. Um, if you are under the age of 30, you believe this is how astronomy works. And if you're over the age of 50, you can't believe why anybody's wasting their time with things like this. Um, I guess it's a bit ageist for me to say, but um, uh, but I'm right on the cusp here, where I was involved in this, but I was also very suspicious about why we were doing this, because it was crazy. Um, we took imaging of a quarter of the sky in five pass bands. We took spectra of a million galaxies and quasars. Um, and the whole point of the survey was to measure the growth of structure in the universe. So there's a very specific and rigid physical model for cosmology that where the universe starts in a homogeneous state and then structure grows. And the Sloan Digital Sky Survey was designed to measure that growth of structure. And all of the survey, it was baked in as rules for the survey right from the beginning that everything would be operationally algorithmic and repeatable. Everything had to be repeatable. We did violate this in a few ways, but we tried not to. All violations of that were rule violations. Um, and it was literally designed with this long-term statistical value as, as a core principle of the project. It was unbelievably over-designed. The imaging was far deeper than it needed to be to target the spectroscopy. We could have saved a factor of hundreds in observing time because we took images that were way too deep. Um, the spectroscopy was higher signal to noise than it needed to be. We now know we can get redshifts with signal to noise of one per pixel. Um, so we could, have gotten, we could have done the whole Sloan Digital Sky Survey in like three months and still achieve the large scale structure goals. However, those weren't the most important papers. In fact, the project was, produced something like 10, I think it's just under 10,000 papers. Um, so I think the, it'll pass 10,000 this year. It might, yeah. It's, it's ridiculous. And, and then it also led to these, legacy, these uh, subsequent surveys that use the same hardware to do new science. And these are also producing thousands of papers. So it is absolutely productive. It was extremely over budget, but it was extremely productive. And even though it went over budget by a factor of something like 14, depending on how you uh, account it, um, it was more productive than anyone expected by a factor of more than 14. So actually, we, we, it was a win in the end. Um, now, one thing, I, I can also now branch off here and go off on this, because one of the interesting things is if the, if the project had been budgeted accurately from the outset, it would never have been launched. So there's a very interesting question about honesty and budgeting. And, and of course, the decadal surveys in astronomy every year worry about this problem. And it's a very hard problem. Because at some level, we do have to dream. But at another level, we have to know what we're getting into. Anyway, it's complicated. One of the reasons that we didn't all end up in jail is that there were university partners. And the university partners, many of whom were private universities, were able to complete the project. Um, I, at the time, worked for the Institute for, uh, Institute for Advanced Study, which was one of the university partners. Um, uh, good. So what do I conclude from all this? I don't know. I, these are very tentative conclusions. First thing is, SCSS did not get everything right. I'm not claiming that SCSS was a perfectly designed project. In fact, it was kind of a mess in various ways. But it was operationally algorithmic. And the over-design meant that there was tons of additional unplanned discovery space. So when you look at the 10,000 papers from Sloan, they're not primarily about the growth of structure in the universe. That's not what they're primarily about. They, we discovered families of asteroids. We discovered new classes of st variable stars. We, uh, we, found, uh, we were able to do uh, kinematics of the Milky Way halo. We found ultra-faint galaxies that were being disrupted. We've, I mean, ridiculous things. Um, and really, this, and really, it's this inefficiency that the survey was over-designed produced a lot of its success. David, was most of the cost overrun software? No, most of the cost overrun was uh, 
was failure to start. So various subsystems weren't working, and so then the marching army had to live for another year and another year and another year. So that was, I would say, that was probably uh, three quarters of the overrun. And then some of the overrun was just straight up unreal, lack of realism about 35 CCDs and, um, and uh, filters and telescope control. Um, but it is true that the software did cost more than they thought. Um, and one of the things, one of the legacies that's actually of Sloan, there's many legacies of Sloan, and I'm not going to talk about them, but, but the, one of them is that now projects in astronomy do have software budgets. Yes. And that's, you know, they're still too small, but they're not zero. Um, uh, good. So present day cosmology experiments are, are much are at a different place now, partly because, and this is a little hard to get across if you're not an astronomer, but cosmology is an extremely mature field. It's, it's almost as mature as high energy physics. There's a very, very rigid uh, model with a small number of free parameters that explains a very large fraction of the data. And so a lot of the questions are very mature questions about, um, about measuring particular parameters or combinations of parameters, and those, and, and we are required by our funding partners, whether our funding partners are universities or foundations or uh, agencies, to show that we're making an efficient project to meet our goals. And that efficiency could be disastrous. Um, what does this have to do with real-time decision making? Nothing. But it does have something to do with decision making. And that's going to come up into the next thread. We're, we're about to change topics again. And, but just before we change topics, let me just say that it is very, when you're doing parameter estimation in a rigid model, you have this rigid model like the, the standard model of particle physics and you want to know, now you know the Higgs is there. Now you just want to measure the mass of the Higgs. So if your only goal is to measure the mass of the Higgs, there's just a very well-defined set of things you're going to do and you know how to say which experiment is better than which because you can just measure the Fisher information you have on the Higgs. Um, and uh, it is extremely easy to kind of quantitatively say which design gets you the best measurement. But we don't know how to quantitatively say what project gets us the most discovery space. And this came up yesterday. The LHC is designed to have tons of discovery space. It's also over-designed. It's over-designed for 125 GeV Higgs. And it's over-designed, why? Because maybe we'll find new physics. Um, but it's hard to be quantitative about this unplanned discovery space. And I'd like to I do the analogy to testing in schools. When we, we complain about testing in schools, why? Not because we don't think we should be evaluating teaching. Obviously, we should be evaluating teaching. The problem is that when we do testing in schools, we test the things we can test. And we don't know how to test the things we really think are important. There's no school test for creativity, for synthesis, for um, bringing down the capitalist patriarchy. <laughs> okay, I'm going to switch gears again, which I think is what we all want for our children. It certainly is what I want. Um, uh, good, switching gears again. So I want to talk a little bit about astrometry.net, basically because astrometry.net is one of the projects I'm most proud of in my career. Um, and this is what it does. You give it an image of the night sky. And that image could be something you took with a mobile phone camera, or it could be something that's a scientific image, or it could be um, something from a webcam, or, uh, or uh, so people have used this for telescopes. Or it could be a historical image, like an image from a plate archive or whatever. Some image that you just don't know the provenance of. And one thing I could say as a little bit of background here is that Harvard Plate Archive, for instance, has millions and millions of gold glass plates. And many of them are misfiled. So they actually don't know which plate. For, for some 5 to 10% of their plates, they don't know what's the pointing of that plate. So how do they figure out which part of the sky is this plate? So that's, that was one of our motivating examples. There's a bunch of other motivating examples for this project. It now has, uh, actually it has yeah, tens of thousands of users, actually. This project has been very successful. So this was the first ever image, reliable image recognition system. It takes that image, figures out where it is on the sky and how big it is, what orientation, and, and of course, labels the objects in it and all that stuff. It was the first ever reliable image recognition system in any domain, and of course, uh, we didn't get rich. Um, uh, the project is, so this is Dustin Lang, who is, talk about full stack. You know, people talk about in data science, what's, where, where's somebody who's full stack? D Dustin Lang is the example of somebody who's a full stack data scientist. Here are the components that astrometry.net needed to work. First of all, it has to automatically detect stars in background in arbitrary imaging. 
So I don't care whether it's a Galax image or a webcam, we have to be able to find the stars reliably in there and centroid them. That alone is something that deserves a Nobel Prize. Um, then, and, and I should say there, uh, Mike Blanton at NYU did a lot of stuff for us. Um, then what we do is we look up geometric hashes. We came up with clever geometric hashes for figures of stars. Then you have to look up geometric hashes that you have in your image against the database of every geometric hash you can possibly make on the sky, which is combinatorically large. So we have a combinatorically large database lookup, and so we had to build the fastest KD tree in the world. That was done by Kier Meyerly, who wasn't on my original list, but he's a genius uh, that was an undergrad working with Dustin when Dustin was a grad student. Um, Sorry, what exactly are these geometric hashes? Like, what is being hashed? And uh -huh. So you take, a, you take a figure of n stars, so, and, and the code can work with n, any n, but we usually work at four. It turns out four is a very good number to work at. So you have four stars here in your image. You've just chosen four of your stars. And now what we want to do is write a dis real number descriptor of this object such that we can look it up in a database. And the way that works is we use the most widely separated pair to establish a coordinate system, and we ask what are the coordinates of the other two stars in that coordinate system. And, the, and this, this hash has some really beautiful properties. It's four-dimensional, right, because there's two two-dimensional positions, but those four-dimensional objects fill a four-dimensional hypersphere. Well, a, the interior of a five-dimensional, uh, whatever, three-dimensional <laughs> hybrid, anyway, whatever it is, um, they, they fill that uniformly. So, we, so the, the, one of the reasons we have the fastest KD tree in the world is that we have a very beautiful hash that it very uniformly fills its space. So we were able to use a lot of geometry under the hood. So the, the, our, our KD tree, as though it was, it was in 2010 the fastest KD tree in the world, it was under extremely severe circumstances. Good. Um, then once we find matches in this database, those are only hypotheses. So then we use Bayesian inference to put uh, probabilities over those hypotheses for what the image pointing must be. And then we did explicit decision theory using a utility and looking at expected utility over posteriors over hypotheses. Talk about full stack. This is one paper. <laughs> this was one chapter of Dustin Lang's thesis. Um, and then it automatically visualizes the results. Um, everything's open source, of course. And if you go to astrometry.net, you can get the code and also see a tutorial and see our users and all that stuff. And there's also, at astrometry.net, there's also um, some, uh, uh, there's some community there. You can see other people's images as they're going into the system and you can play with it. Yeah. Has it been used for other uh, image analysis? You think there are sciences? Uh, various people have thought. So there's the gum spot positioning system, which is, uh, you know, on the streets of New York, there's little black spots on the, uh, on the sidewalk. Those black spots are where people spat out gum and it got dirt on it. Um, and each one is this unique pattern. There's also, there's a, um, there a, was a project, there's certain kinds of reef sharks that have certain patterns on their sides. So no one really used astrometry.net directly in these other applications, but the geometric hashing ideas did propagate into some other areas. But I just, I was thinking those, light, those lights you see on a night flight somewhere, somewhere between Nebraska and Nevada. <laughs> Oh, yeah, I've often, well, anyway, we've thought a lot about other kinds of systems like recognizing buildings. There's a lot of architecture features you could use. There's uh, maps. If you look down on the ground, you should be able to take a bit of a map. And do, but we haven't actually gone into those areas. By the way, um, this, kind of, uh, this kind of system is not favored. Like, what are the current winning things in image recognition these days? They're all convolutional neural networks. Convolutional neural networks win everything now. And one thing we've never asked is whether or not we could beat this with a convolutional neural network. And I hereby offer Bloom dinner at Chez Panisse. If you can eat, even if you get 1% of our performance with a convolutional neural network, I'll buy you dinner. <laughs> can I define what 1% is? And we might have to negotiate yeah. that with a third party. What did you use to train it? There's no training. That's the thing. This is not a <coughs> trained system. It's an expert system. So we built, there's this um, immense database of geometric hashes, which are based on cataloged stars. 
In fact, the system currently runs on the Gaia catalog. Oh, that, yeah, that's what I was asking. So where did yeah. these <coughs> actually come from? Before Gaia, we were using the USNOB astrometric catalogs. And, and there's, a lot of very in, there's a lot of stuff that goes into building this database, because you actually don't want to build arbitrary quads of stars. You want to build quads of stars that are co-visible. So meaning an image is likely to have all of those stars in it. So that we did all sorts of brightness slices. And, um, and then we made catalogs that are more likely to work well with ultraviolet images and ones that are more likely to work with infrared images. And there's a lot of engineering. Like just this line alone involves a lot of engineering. Um, this project's just ridiculous. I mean, if you're starting an engineering company, you need to hire Dustin Lang. Um, Good. One thing I just want to focus on, because it is relevant for this audience, is that when, so astrometry.net only receives probabilistic information about pointing, rotation, and scale, right? We do this database lookup, but that only gives us hypotheses, and then we put posterior probabilities on those hypotheses using a likelihood function that's about the stars in the image that weren't in the hash that generated the hypothesis. So we hold out the, the hash, and then we do a probabilistic question on the remaining stars. But we have to decide what to say to the user. Do we say to the user, yes, we've got your solution, or do we say, no, we don't know? And to make that decision, we didn't want to just do it on the balance of probabilities. Because if we did it on balance of probabilities, around half the time, we'd be sending bullshit. And astronomers are not happy to get wrong answers. So it relates to the discussion yesterday about five sigma that came up in the LHC conversation. Why is LHC at five sigma? That could be recast as a decision theory question about what's your utility. So we judged that um, we had to maintain our reputation, that, um, that if we gave bad answers, we would lose long-term customers. We might satisfy short-term customers, but lose long-term customers. So we actually explicitly use Bayesian decision th theory. There's a table of money amounts in this paper. Um, and I think we're the only people in astronomy who've explicitly given a, a utility function in dollars. Um, even the Dark Energy Task Force didn't do that. Um, good, so how did we make that? How did we do this? Um, we, we had to ask. We had to think about our community. It's kind of like, how does a company decide what to charge for its product? It's actually a very similar, it's a very related question to how a company decides how much to charge, especially for an intangible product. Um, like if you, I don't know, if you host on WordPress, they charge you $13 a year or whatever. Like how did they get that $13 number? And it has something to do with trust and reputation and how it propagates and how do we value different kinds of users? Which users do we want? And we did want users who were conservative and wanted uh, reliability. And we believe that reputations go bad easily. Like in the early days of Sloan, we did a data release that wasn't so good. And it really hurt our reputation as a survey. And we had to rebuild that reputation over many years. So we used all that information to make a, um, a utility function. Um, in the end, of course, we just made it up because and I'm going to tell you why we had to make it up in just a second. Um, it is very hard to make a utility function. And this is in a domain of absolutely no consequence. If you go into the domain of consequence, we were hearing about self-driving cars yesterday uh, and today. Uh, then you really have to think about what your utility function is. This is really non-trivial. You can't just sit in your Bayesian tower and say, hey, it's a highly probable that's a stop sign. Um, uh, <laughs> So one thing, so about when we were working on astrometry.net, I spent a month at Google. I was just um, for complicated reasons. But basically, I was just working on a scientific project with somebody who happened to be at Google. So I went to Google, and I worked at Google for a month. And while I was at Google, I learned that Google has a single objective function that it tries to optimize, which is long-term future discounted free cash flow. And that is the objective every one of us in this room should optimize in every decision we make in all of our lives. Whether you're going to buy a coffee at Strata, where the obvious optimum is don't buy that, or uh, choosing who you're going to live the rest of your life with. Um, you should be thinking long-term future discounted free cash flow. And wh what is this? What is this thing? Why is this the thing? But it is the thing. And you will, you will think, you think this is ridiculous. And then you're going to think about it and sleep about it. You wake up in the middle of the night and go, oh, damn it. Um, the reason, first of all, it's long-term future. Because 
In the long run, all you really care about is the long run. You're willing to take some short-term pain. Long-term, you want to be successful. So it's long-term, and unfortunately, long-term is the killer because it, the, the, literally the definition of long-term, if you take microeconomics, what's the definition of long-term? The long-term is the time scale over which everything's variable. So you don't have a good model of the world for the long term. We don't know what astronomy is going to be like in 15 years. Like 15 years would be pretty long term for astronomy because lots of things change. New classes of objects get discovered, new telescopes get built, uh, new meteors hit facilities, um, new wars uh, bomb out telescope observatories and so on. Um, second, discounted. There's a discount rate and you prefer to get your cash now than to get it later. And the discount rate is different for different people. My discount rate is a lot lower than a graduate student's discount rate. And a graduate student's discount rate drops to ve or becomes very high right as they are entering the job market. Um, and then why is it free cash flow? It's current revenue less current expenses. Free cash flow is very similar to profit, but it's not the same as profit because it does, you're not allowed to count against it long-term expenditures that grow your company because those are the reasons we're doing these things. You are doing your astronomy to get your long-term uh, capabilities improved. Um, OK, good. Uh, this is the thing that we need to have a model of if we are going to automate decision making. That's my position. Now, I, now of course, the fact that, yeah, here I just say it. The fact that the objective is explicitly long-term means you'll never have a precise estimate of, your long, of this utility. And if you go into companies and look at the situation, like if you look at Google, they were explicitly optimizing this thing, but then they would talk about it in heuristic terms. They did not have a quantitative model for it, even though it was their explicit objective. Um, but I think we will be able to make proxies for this in astronomy, and we should. And I'm working on that now, actually. Um, the discount rate is a strong function of career stage. Cost and benefit, oh, this is an important thing. Scientific papers have values that are in the hundreds of thousands of dollars. And it, a lot of astronomers don't lose sight of this. Like I know people who are like, they don't want to send their graduate students to a conference. And I'm like, uh, because it's too expensive, it's like 3,000 bucks or whatever. I'm like, you realize the paper they're writing is costing you $125,000. It really doesn't matter whether or not you send them to this conference. And, and the way I get this number is by just doing full cost accounting. Just do full cost accounting. A typical paper that I write has five people on it. They've worked on it for months. They're all reasonably well paid uh, white collar workers. And we also use some facilities. Um, if, you used, if you used a few nights of keck time, you've got it right there. Um, uh, and one last point is it is pointless to compute this in any units except exchangeable currency. And the reason is you have to make trades between qualitatively different things. You have to decide, are we going to hire somebody else or are we going to buy another CCD? You have to be able to make those trades. And so those have different costs and they also have different benefits in terms of your utility. And you can only make the trades if it's in dollars. I put Bitcoin up there for Josh's benefit. Um, that's not his only contribution to this talk. Uh, good. What are the implications for this meeting? We need to build utility models. Our utility models need to explicitly look towards the long term, the end goals. So we need to be building utility models that are thinking about publications, future grant funding, junior scientist careers. Those are our objectives. Yeah. Do you also um, include the opportunity cost of not doing things? Of course. You have to include opportunity cost. And, that's, and of, actually, when I was at Google, another thing they said at Google in public meetings was their biggest thing. They always said, and they probably still do, that their biggest single cost is opportunity cost. That they're not doing things that they could be doing, given the smart people that are in the room. Um, and believe me, I think about that a lot for my own personal career because like right now we're just starting SDSS5. If I get into SDSS5, there's a bunch of things, other things I can't do. And that's a big opportunity cost. So SDSS5 has to be a kick-ass project for me to do it. But I, I can see how you could eventually model all the things that are within your you know, time horizon of a project yeah. you're going to do. But yeah. to figure out the opportunity of everything you're not going to do, that's an infinite space, right? Exactly. That's, I guess you could say that is another reason this is incomputable. Although I actually think it's the same reason as the long-term reason, because those opportunities are really about long-term losses. Because on short time scales, you could always switch what you're doing. Yeah. Um, 
Uh, yeah, I'm, I, I'm talking like this. I'm talking like this, but I'm not going to answer those questions. <laughs> yeah. So, so, in this, in this economic model, where, where does the notion of competition fit? I mean, what, what sort of, what notion of, of agencies with, with, in, in indivisible self-interest, come, come into mm. play? I don't really have a theory about that, but, um, and of course I. Sometimes when I talk about this stuff, I talk about it at the community level, so I'm about to go there. So I'm actually, in a few slides, I'm going to be talking about the, the long-term future discounted free cash flow of the whole astronomical community. So I'm, I always think about astronomy very cooperatively. Um, but you know, certainly some sub-branches of astronomy think of it very competitively. But then I would just sweep it into these kinds of questions. So I'm not thinking of it as a game. If that's where you're, what you're thinking. Yeah, I'm not thinking about it as a game. I'm thinking about us. Right, I, yeah, good. And, and then it probably is useful to think of it as a game, but I, I'm not. I'm explicitly not, and I'm a very much a believer that the astronomy community is working together, which, you know, you can observationally, you could argue about that. Yeah. Do you have anything about uh, more soft uh, parameters here? So how much people like doing their job? For example, these kind of things, do you include them? In yeah, I, good. I haven't really thought about that, ex and, but I do often find myself advising people to work on things that they love because they're going to do them better. Um, but I. That might go against so, any of these. Yeah, right, <laughs> right. It could go into any of these things. I mean, you're much more likely to have career success if you love doing astronomy um, than if you hate it. <laughs> But you know, some people have survived the job market okay, hating but astronomy. I think it connects to competition. It's uh, also being yeah. nice to others, and being sometimes less competitive. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, so it, there's a, yeah, I, but I right. I understand that if this is too difficult to model. Oh, well, I am not going to ever write down an explicit equation because I can't. Mm -hmm. So I'm a mess here. Um, this is really pure bullshit. This is one full hour of bullshit. <laughs> usually, usually at workshops like this, I'm limited to 20 minutes of bullshit. But anyway, um, good. Let me just make a very, very small scale comment. Let's go just to a really trivial thing. You're just going to write a paper where you say, I've discovered a new planet, or I can rule out Mond, or something. You're writing some paper which just said, with some very straightforward scientific result. Just writing this in your abstract is a decision. It is a decision that one model is, more, is better than another. Now, the way hardcore Bayesians tend to think about this, and I'm pretty hardcore Bayesian, but one of the ways Bayesians tend to think about this is that you do marginalized likelihoods. You compare marginalized likelihoods. You want to fully marginalize and then ask questions about the marginalized likelihoods or marginalized posterior probabilities. You want to think about model probabilities. But I'm explicitly saying that that is wrong. That is not the right way. You cannot make a decision that way. But those are probabilities. They're not decisions. They're probabilities. Probabilities are not decisions. And it's very important not to confuse these things. The other thing is, these integrals that you need to do here are hella expensive. Uh, we've burned so much CPU time doing marginalized likelihoods. You really have to be integrating utilities over your parameters within your models. That's what you need to be integrating. And notice, I just mentioned that you don't know those utilities precisely. So if you're burning tons of CPU time to compute an integral that isn't actually the integral you're supposed to be computing, you're probably making a mistake. And that's a very straightforward consequence of all this, and I think it's undeniable. Um, actually, Jane's, the, 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 Bi the Bayesian Bible, Jane's, uh, makes this point explicitly, but people don't usually read that far in. Um, switch gears again. Okay, uh, this is Bloom's slide, Bloom's joke that we should maybe have Starbucks, which is a currency that we trade among astronomical facilities or assets. So imagine we have a heterogeneous network of astronomical resources. Now I'm, I'm meta-upping to community level. The community does have Actually, one of, my, one of the things I like to say in a different talk that I give is that even though individual astronomers might be frequentist or Bayesian, the whole astronomical community, because it's a rational actor, is the whole community or quasi-rational actor is pretty Bayesian. Like publications that are produced in astronomy are kind of distributed over hypotheses with about the probabilities that we hold them to be correct. 
Um, and, the, and the community as a whole, in some sense, is trading some kind of currency for resources. But we, I'm just arguing we should make this explicit. Um, and one of the nice things is, if you were able to make this explicit, then you could objectively, uh, well, not objectively. Not, uh, objectively is a bad word here. Everything's subjective in this talk. Utility is subjective. Probability is subjective. Everything's subjective. So forget that. So cross out that word. Um, but you could optimally apportion resources in principle. So it's, it's hilarious. I gave a talk here a month ago and chatted with some people. And they suggested that. And we are actually doing oh, good. this with the SED machine. Good, I see the machine. A great example. So if you're not an astronomer, so LSST is going to produce enormous numbers of alerts, like tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of alerts a night. There's going to be various facilities that are very relatively low cost that are going to follow up as many as they can. None of them can follow up 100,000. Most of them can follow up tens a night. So decision making has to take place. So this is, this and is having an explicit did. utility, great. So we, Good. we so it, it's quite interesting. So the unit of uh, buck. It's called the SRK. Yes. Um, <laughs> and the way I know why. Yes. It's a and, TLA. Uh, yes. And the way we did it was um, we assigned a unit for each observing 15 minute observing sequence during the night. Mm -hmm. So there are X number yep. of units over the year. Yeah. And then there's a weighting factor depending upon which group is triggering what. So we value certain triggers because they're yeah. rare to Good, yeah. more and that's and that's how yeah. we set up this currency to yeah. do this and you're a portion and you can trade yeah exactly you can trade with these humans dollars. are great at this so yeah. humans are great at trading currency now i'm just suggesting we need to make the assets trade the currency directly yeah, yeah. yeah. just in terms of currency getting up a little above the data how about citation <laughs> I, no because you might you might be willing Negative citation, positive citation. Well, for instance, it, it really, you, and, and that's too short term. You want to be thinking long term. Long term, I want to rule astronomy. So if individual citations, I, I might even sacrifice citations in order to get long term control over all assets. <laughs> um, uh, what else was I going to say? Oh, yeah, and probably it would look like a live auction or a market. So, so and now I want to just go to global telescope networks. Just, I just want to come step back from that. Okay, that's crazy talk, I, and it's bullshit. But let's talk about some things that are very real. So one is, there's all these global telescope networks out there, and there's, they're beautiful, and they allow you to do things like do 24-hour observing, even though the Earth's rotating because you have observatories all over the Earth. And there's some, there, and the amazing thing is, some are operated by amateurs. There's this great microlensing collaboration that's largely amateurs. Um, and there's the AAVSO, uh, which does variable star observing. There's a lot of really beautiful networks that are, that are um, global. And there's a lot of focus on making sure that the nodes in the network are as similar as possible and the data are as uniform as possible. This is pessimal. We should not be doing that. If you're not an astronomer, pessimal is the opposite of optimal. Um, for instance, when you're running a company, do you try to hire employees that are as identical as possible? Yes, some people do. <laughs> but they're not the employers that are a good representation of what we want to do in astronomy. Um, and one of the reasons, there's a lot of reasons people try to make things as homogeneous as possible. But the main one is not a legitimate reason, and that's simplicity. It's not legitimate for us to ask that our data analysis be simple. That's not a legitimate request. We should be asking for our data analysis to be as informative as possible, or for us to learn the most. It shouldn't be, it's not simplicity that we're shooting for, it's knowledge that we're shooting for. Um, or it's long-term future discounted free cash flow, which is probably not measured by simplicity. Um, uh, but but there are, there are some good reasons that people like homogeneity. One is that there's no theory of how to make trades. I'm developing a theory of how to make trades, but right now there's no theory of how to make trades. And the other is that um, it's easier to maintain facilities where there's a lot of homogeneity, and it's hard to maintain heterogeneous facilities. Um, so there's, it's a lot of issues. Um, so our vision, our is unspecific here, me, my vision, um, and, but I think it's also a vision of people in this room, is that we would follow up these time domain operations with, by trading 
uh, assets in a heterogeneous network, and that the assets should have a utility model. And some of the assets could be humans. There's no sense in which all the assets have to be robots. Um, but, but obviously, for some projects I'm interested in, all the assets have to be robots. And this is not a near-term goal. The reason it's not a near-term goal is I don't have any of this technology ready. Um, uh, I just said this, blah, blah, blah. But I, I wanted to point out that heterogeneity is incredibly useful. Like, for instance, sampling theorems. There's these sampling theorems. When you have regularly sampled data, there's all sorts of frequencies you can't see. Jitter the sampling, free, the sampling times a little bit, and all of those theorems clean up. Um, uh, right now, LSST is going to take every single exposure 30 seconds long. If there's an astrophysical phenomenon shorter than 30 seconds, they can't see it. They randomize their exposure times, they can see it. It's like just that, just science, more science. You get to science more if you do more heterogeneity. Spectral coverage, same thing. The way, like, why would you always observe the sky in the same band passes? That would be insane. Um, once again, coming back to the Sloan Digital Sky Survey, I'm nearly done. Um, because here's where I come back to each of my themes. I'm just going to say something about these. And one of them is the original plan for Sloan was to do a single pass over the sky of imaging and rely on a calibration telescope to tell us what the transparency was and just rely on system stability to give us good calibration. That completely failed. And what we did, this was with um, Finkbeiner and Schlegel and Nikhil Padmanaban, is we convinced the survey to do some stripes at wrong angles so we would get the data crossing data. And that way we got, we got some stars that would see different detector locations. Note, heterogeneity. The same star sees different detector locations. That allowed us to tie together the different parts of the detector. And we delivered the highest quality calibration for the survey, which is now the standard calibration for the survey. In fact, the, all the calibration data that were taken for the survey were shelved. They never got used. Um, so this tiny bit of heterogeneity enormously improved what we could do with the Sloan survey. And that's trivial heterogeneity. NASA Kepler. Kepler kept its pointing as stable as possible so that every star is exactly in the same place. That's a great idea because it makes the data very easy to use. But it prevented us from learning anything about the spacecraft's calibration. And we can show that there are limits to questions you can ask with the data at the end because we don't have that information. We don't have a flat field for Kepler, and we can't have one because of operationally how it operated. Now, now with K2 mission, we're learning a little bit about the flat field, but only a little bit. Um, good. We talk about that there and in some white papers that we wrote. Um, everything I've said here would substantially complexify operations. So this is, comes at a cost. Everything I'm saying does have a cost. So we have to do cost benefit again, um, et cetera, et cetera. This is like the, every talk. There's a theme of talks today that you have to go fractal, uh, like this inception aspect. Um, but anyway, I think we have an obligation. I think there's an ethical obligation to do as well as we can. We can't say, well, we're just going to do it this way because it's simpler. That's just unethical. We're asking people for hundreds of millions of dollars. Um, and uh, even the Simons Foundation is fundamentally money coming from the public. Um, now, of course, I have to disclose here. This is my ethics slide. I have to disclose here. I would benefit enormously if we switch to this mode. Um, and finally, coming back to radial velocity experiments, if we could make progress towards specifying this utility, even some proxies, then we could build algorithmic adaptive programs that would be just as efficient as humans are at making decisions, but would be algorithmic so that we would be able to pass uh, statistical tests through those same algorithms. And um, if the utility we write down is sophisticated enough, it'll even generate, generate the statistical controls naturally. So we're working on this now. This is a project we're doing. Uh, right now, trying to see whether or not we could build uh, test follow-up campaigns that would be algorithmic and then see if we can get a time allocation committee to accept one, which is the more harder problem. Good. Um, that's it. That, my conclusion slide is just the trigger warnings that I should have given you at the beginning. Thank you. So uh, just a historical point, the Heterogeneous Telescope Network was a thing like a decade ago. We had conferences called Heterogeneous Yeah, Telescope I remember. Network. Yeah, yeah. We had technologies called uh, real-time you know, markup languages for robots. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Um, 
all of the tech kind of existed, and uh, and even the notion of Starbucks was like Hessman in 2006. So these ideas of, of what you're proposing have been around for a while, and they never really took off. I know. And one of the yep. questions that I still have is is why, mm -hmm. um, at some level, Good. and it's discussed in a lot of those early papers, it is not a technological problem, it's a sociological one. You, you've hinted at that, but I, yeah. you know, given that this idea has been around for yeah. decades, why, why isn't this taking off? Good. I, so I don't have an answer to that, but I, I would say that the more and more voices in the radial velocity community, and the radial velocity community controls a lot of ground-based observing now. If you look how many instruments are being built, something like 15 extreme precision instruments are being built right now. So if, the, if those all com complete, a large fraction of ground-based observing will be radial velocity. And that community is feeling a little bit of the pressure that they're not being used statistically. And believe me, we're going to turn up the heat. For the, during the decadal survey, we will really turn up the heat. And so I also think the community is getting much more uh, statistically sophisticated, is the second thing. And then a third thing is related to this cosmology point. So the cosmology missions, because they're so, uh, the cosmology missions are so um, uh, specific and mature, where they can really compute exactly what they're going to produce. Now, in the, when you think about the decadal process, that's being competed with, against exoplanet people who are like, hey, we're going to find cool shit. Um, so the exoplanet community is going to have to come together and demonstrate that they are going to achieve uh, statistical goals as well as discovery goals. Um, and so I think that pressure coming from the parts of astronomy that have very well-defined things will help. But, but, I, but I'm not really answering your question, because you could have said all those same things going into the last decadal survey, mm -hmm. and it didn't happen. So uh, my optimism has been rewarded in the past. That's all I got. Like a mutual <laughs> fund. No. Future success is no sense. So you mentioned discovery, but one major class of discovery is anomaly detection. Uh-huh, yeah. Which it, for which heterogeneity is a terrible idea, right? Not necessarily. I mean, it depends just how. He yeah. So the question is about um, anomaly detection. So at some level, imagine imagine the sky. Every star in the sky is not at all variable. Like there's no variable stars, and then and you build a calibration system for your. You know, you self calibrate your data under the assumption that every time you return to the star, it is exactly the same brightness. Then it turns out they are variable you will throw off your calibration. So that's true. And so in that sense, in that sense, the heterogeneity plus bad assumptions would be bad. But heterogeneity with good assumptions is not, I think, bad for anomaly detection. So let me, so one way to think but about true, it. True anomalies are fundamentally about bad assumptions about the universe, right? Well, right, good. An, an anomaly is a bad assumption. So in that sense, right, so in that sense, if you say there are anomalies, you're saying that my assumptions are bad. Uh, right. I think it is, it is very important to build systems such that you can detect the unexpected, as they say. Um, and what does that look like? I don't know exactly. You might, well, for, for one, for one, all, you make assumption. And one of the things that's wrong with the word assumption is people have this kind of vision that once you've made an assumption, you're stuck with it. But of course, all assumptions are testable. So I think it's very important in, in a project like this, the more you automate, the more you have to take each assumption, project your data into the space of that assumption, and show that that assumption is correct. Um, so, for instance, in, uh, we built a model of the Gaia data where we assumed that stars are compactly distributed on the HR diagram. And there are anomalous stars that have no other partners near them in Gaia. There are such stars. We don't understand what they all are yet. It, because our model makes the fundamental assumption that these stars must come from the compact distribution, they get drawn into the compact distribution and put there. And, um, but that's totally visible because you can just go back and ask which are the stars that the model was least happy with. And those stars do appear. And then you can see they're not, it's not like they're hidden. 
but you do have to decide to go look for them. So I think if you did something like this, you would want to put a lot of effort into looking at the badly described parts of the world. I think that would be critical, but it would also be very productive. So, so any way you come up with to model utility, it's always going to be somewhat flawed. Mm -hmm. right? So the risk is you set up a whole bunch of perverse incentives that you don't yeah. foresee, Good. and then you know there's some risk of forcing the community into yeah. you know all of a sudden everyone is looking for tiny asteroids. Absolutely, yeah. So the question is about bad incentives. Yeah. yeah. No, and so many like the story. You know, we we in my group we do tons of optimization of things. Like we do things like we optimize apertures for uh, Kepler photometry. And you write down an objective function that you're going to optimize to do photometry on this star, and it goes, whoop, there's my aperture. Because you get really good data here. It's perfectly flat because there's no flux. Uh, and uh, uh, it's very easy to write down objectives that are bad objectives. So I have a lot of reactions to that. The first is you, you really have to simulate the hell out of anything you're going to do here before you start. And, and by simulate, I don't mean with candy simulations. You have to get really realistic simulations. So in fact, one of the nice things is in the radial velocity space, there's tons of data to use. To use as You could build your simulations out of existing data. Um, that would be very realistic simulations that would give you a sense of what the data are like. So, so one thing is you have to simulate the hell out of things and make sure it doesn't put you into perverse spaces. But the other thing is, Many groups have to take this same approach competitively. We will need to compete here because we will make mistakes and we will blow telescope time in the early days chasing bad things. And that will also happen for the supernova uh, or the SED machine uh, follow up because you just can't, ha you, the first time out, you're going to make some mistakes. And so you will, we would have to build this as a set of staged projects that are staged in a right way so that we can fail fast, abort. Um, and one of the interesting things, you know, people are saying driverless cars need to have a kill switch. You know, when we put this into the, the ESO TAC, we're probably going to have to say it has a kill switch. So you're not worried about monopoly situations or things like that? I would, I, well, you know, I, I, will, I will put out a white paper before the decadal survey, and I'll see if everyone in astronomy will sycophantically join my uh, optimization army. Um, but my usual experience with the astronomy community is that they don't. Uh, so really, what I'm really doing here is trying to push the community to think in terms of objectives I really, I, I'm not sure we'll ever hit really what this, but I want us to think in terms of objectives, and I also want to think, as, as, think in terms of being more algorithmic and less heuristic when we take these data. That's all. I would, I would consider it a huge success if we take a tiny step in those two directions. Yeah. So I'm curious about the free cash flow part of the long term. Yes. So just free cash flow. Yeah, you think why it should be operating cash flow? No. Because uh, <laughs> I spent a long time last night trying to understand the difference between operating cash flow and free cash flow. I Fucking complicated. Learn those good. Uh, That's good. <laughs> so you talked a bit about how to think about costs. Yeah. You know, you're trying to write down your profit, but how do you think about the income? Right. So, so the weird thing about this context is we would have to think of the, the income would be in intangibles. We have to put value on intangibles. So publications, citations, discoveries, information about po So the thing that the small scale project we're trying to do right now is put a utility onto um, distributions over distributions of the exoplanet population. So say we build a model of the exoplanet population as a probability distribution over exoplanet properties. The certainty with which we know that we might be able to turn into a utility proxy that would help us make these decisions. But if you really want to go to long-term free cash flow, you'd have to turn that into publications and think about the values of publications and so on. So, and since some of those things are going to happen in your future, not in your present, you have to make decisions before you have them. So the income part of it is exceedingly complicated. And as Josh said, the cost part of it is also complicated because there's an opportunity cost aspect to it as well, which is you know, explicitly intangible. And then how do you fold in making that data public? 
into that model, right? So you're kind of talking about what my benefit is going to be because the income I'm going to derive from this, but then yeah. historically we share that data. Good. For some. The production of valuable data sets is definitely would be counted as income in this. And so for me, it's income that I have produced a data set that other people are using, because that helps me. So that would come into the income side. But one thing that I didn't explicitly mention that you've reminded me to mention is one of the main points of this is everything you, have to, you do has to be wide open. Because the whole point of this is to be bolted to the manifold of reproducibility. You have to be reproducible in every way. Um, because that's the whole point, that it can then be done by in, in uh, legacy projects. Um, but yeah, so, right. And some astronomers would say that if they had to give away their data, it would be a cost to them. Uh, so that also is another thing that shows you just how subjective this is. That's another reason why the astronomical community as a whole is not going to agree with my utility function. All right, let's thank David again.